I'll, I'll start off then with the fact. So you're eight years old, and you hear about the death of Albert Einstein, and you hear he's got unfinished business. And from what I've read, that's kind of one of the big moments in terms of that's almost like for the astronauts the equivalent of watching Apollo Eleven. Your finding out that Albert Einstein had unfinished business was one of the great spurs for you to go into the world of theoretical physics. That's right. When I was eight years old, there was a picture. A picture flashed across the world that changed my life. That picture was simply a picture of a man's desk with all the clutter and all the unfinished books. But on that desk was the unfinished manuscript, according to the caption, of the greatest scientist of our time. So I said to myself, wow, I mean, why couldn't he finish that book? What's so hard? that the greatest scientists of our time couldn't finish that book that I'm looking at right in that picture. I mean, couldn't he ask his mother? I mean, what's so hard? So over the years, I went to the library and I gradually pieced, the, pieced together the history of that picture. That picture was a picture of Albert Einstein's desk the day he died. And that book was The Unified Field Theory an equation perhaps no more than one inch long that would allow him to, quote, read the mind of God. Well, I was hooked. I was eight years old, but I said to myself, wow, this is really something that I have to investigate. So I said to myself, I want to become a physicist. Whatever that is, I didn't know what a physicist did. But I said to myself, this is really neat. This would allow us to read the laws of nature to understand, quote, the mind of God. So I was hooked. And then I began to realize that Einstein spent the last 30 years of his life, from 1920 to 1950, the last 30 years of his life, trying to find this fabled equation. So I said to myself, that's for me. That's what I want to do for a living, become a theoretical physicist. So uh, around that age, or even a little bit older, you can choose. If you'd been in class and the teacher had said, so why do you think we're here? What do you think you would have imagined in, the, in those as, as, as a child, that idea of why, why, are, why is this curious creature on this planet? Well, I like to think of it as a chess game because I used to play chess when I was in the school. And I think that the, we are facing this cosmic chess game where after 2,000 years of investigation, we finally figure out how the pawns move and how the bishops and knights move. And we begin to realize that maybe we have a destiny of some sort. And this destiny is to, first of all, understand the rules, the rules that make chess possible. And then once we have the rules, to become grandmasters. So I would disagree a little bit with my fellow physicists in the sense that I think that humanity in some sense has a destiny of sorts. And that destiny is to become grandmasters of chess. And that chessboard, of course, is the universe. And the rules are the God equation. That is an equation perhaps no more than one inch long that tells us how the pawns move, how the bishops and knights move. And we will become grand masters once we find this God equation. And then we'll understand the rules of the game. Is time travel possible? Are there other universes? What happened before the Big Bang? Are there other dimensions? Are there wormholes and gateways to other universes? What's on the other side of a black hole? What happened before Genesis chapter one, verse one in the beginning? All these questions cannot be answered with our present day understanding of physics. We need the God equation. Now it's interesting, some of the subjects you taught there, I, I was thinking when I've done tours, there are certain questions that for some reason always grip the audience and they always want to know the answer. And they're sometimes kind of, not exactly disappointed, but it's not what they think. And I would say too, that one of them that you mentioned there, which is you know, what happened before the universe? And the other one is, what is the universe expanding into? And that both of those things which give us the idea that people want something to contain this information, it seems to me. And of course, both of these, one of them we have a, an understanding of, the other is, I suppose, far more deeply troubling and part of what your book is also dealing with. 
Well, you know, Einstein says that our universe is a bubble. We live on the skin of the bubble and the bubble's expanding. That's called the Big Bang Theory. But these new theories like string theory says that there are other bubbles out there. Now, when these bubbles collide and form a bigger bubble, or these bubbles fission in half, that's the Big Bang. And to me, this is very pleasing because you see, my parents were Buddhists. They believe that, well, there is no God, but there's a nirvana. There is a higher order and harmony to things, a nirvana, but no God. And, but however, when I was a child, I was raised as a Presbyterian. And in the Presbyterian religion, of course, being Protestant, there was a beginning. So I've had these two diametrically opposed ideas in my head. The universe either had a beginning or it didn't. There's no in between. There's no merging of the two until now. Now we can merge these two theories together into a single theory. Because you see, our universe had a beginning. Our universe had a big bang when our bubble popped into existence and expanded. But there are other bubbles out there. And these other bubbles are floating in nirvana. Nirvana, this timelessness, this much larger arena. And so even though our bubble had a beginning, just like the Bible says, just like in Buddhism, there is a higher order where these bubbles float float into a higher dimension. And what is that higher dimension? 11 dimensional hyperspace, which is the world that I live in. I work on string theory. Every day I, I, I grapple with equations in 11 dimensional hyperspace. But the point I'm raising is, it's possible to meld, meld together the Judeo-Christian theory of the origin of the universe, Genesis, with Buddhism by ha having this multiverse theory. <laughs> then you're gonna ask me a question that I often get asked. If there are other universes out there, parallel universes, then is Elvis Presley still alive in one of these parallel universes? And the answer is, well, quite possibly yes. The king could still be alive in another universe, not ours, of course. And then, of course, there's a terrible thing that he's also died in so many different ways in all those other universes as well. That's the trouble with it. it. There's optimism and there's pessimism in all of those universes, isn't there? That's right. But you see, this picture is forced upon us. It's not as if we can choose A, B, C. I like this universe versus that universe. We look at the data and the data says that, well, the universe was a quantum event. And being a quantum event, it means it could happen again and again and again. And there are universes being born even as we speak. Even as we speak, somewhere in hyperspace, another universe, a baby bubble is being born. A universe right before our eyes. So in other words, what is the universe expanding into? If the universe is everything there is, how can it expand? The universe is three-dimensional. We live in a world of length, width, and height. But what is it expanding into? is expanding into a larger arena, this bubble bath. And what is a bubble bath? A higher dimension. In fact, 11 dimensions. We think that our universe, the nirvana of Buddhism, <laughs> would be 11 dimensional hyperspace, a space beyond space. And we're now, just floating on a bubble. See, this is the bit that I, I'm always fascinated. When you get to 11 dimensions, and when I when I talk to, to physicists, it's some people, that I speak to seem to have what a, a visual imagination, which manage, which somehow I'm not entirely sure what it is that they see, but they there there is a, a visual imagination that goes with things which are way beyond our our normal our, our, our usual mundane observations of, of of the world in front of us. And other physicists that I talk to kind of just they see the numbers and they see the equations. Where do you go when you're thinking in eleven dimensions? How much can you tell me about what your mind is creating in that situation? Well, first of all, why do we even have to have higher dimensions? You see, we have four fundamental forces that govern the universe. Gravity, which keeps us on the floor, electricity and magnetism, which lights up our cities, and then the two nuclear forces that light up the stars and the sun, four fundamental forces. But when you put them together, they don't fit. 
the four fundamental forces do not fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. However, when you go to a higher dimension, a dimension that you cannot see or touch, then all of a sudden, all these forces wrap up into the God equation. And that's why we are forced against our will. We're kicking and screaming, dragged into this world of a higher dimension, because just like a jigsaw puzzle, these jigsaw puzzle pieces fit together if you have a higher dimension. Think of, for example, a crystal, a three-dimensional crystal, and it shatters one day. And you have all these pieces on the floor, and you begin to put these pieces together painfully using glue, putting these pieces together, until finally you have two large pieces that don't fit, two pieces that don't fit. And then you realize that by lifting it into the third dimension, you can put them together in the third dimension. And so you begin to realize that a higher dimension is not just a toy. A higher dimension is there's enough room in which you can fit together all the forces of the universe. It's forced upon you. The mathematics say this is the way to go. Like it or not, kicking or screaming, we're led into the idea that there could be higher dimensions. Now, when I work in higher dimensions, I have to use mathematics because our brain evolved in a world where we have tigers and lions charging at us in the third dimension. We do not have five dimensional tigers lunging at us. If we did, then evolution would have given us a five dimensional brain. But unfortunately, tigers and lions are only in the third dimension. Therefore, evolution did not allow our brain to evolve the ability to visualize a higher dimension. Now, if you're an ant, your ant brain can only visualize two dimensions because there was no necessity for an ant to understand the third dimension. Two dimensions is perfectly fine for an ant. And therefore, ants, the world of an ant is two-dimensional. We live in a three-dimensional world because we don't need a four-dimensional brain. There are no four-dimensional tigers. But when you talk about the Big Bang, and the universe and the God equation, that is the theory of all theories, you're forced kicking and screaming to go outside the third dimension. Just like an ant, we would have to drag an ant kicking and screaming into the third dimension so that we can uh, introduce the ant to the real universe as it actually is. Do you ever feel that in terms of education, I think for in, in a lot of education systems, unless you go to university, to study science you will only live in a newtonian universe that most of what we are taught up to a point and yeah you know, e even when it gets to to actually the theory of relativity that may well be a third or fourth year uh experience in, in in university and so that for a lot of us when we are if you're not a scientist and you suddenly find out that that time for instance is not just a constant when you first find that out and you might be 20 years old 30 years old you might find out reading an article when you're 50 years old it's it seems almost too late to find out those things that some of these ideas which go so much against our kind of un, un normal presumptions and expectations of the world should be seeded in us earlier on in the education process even if we can't understand them in, in deeply well my personal attitude is that science education gets bogged down because it is reduces science to tedium to memorizing trivial facts and figures rather than concepts and principles. Let me give you an example. Uh, Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winner, tells a story that when he was a child, his father would take him into the forest and explain birds to him, why they're shaped the way they are, how they eat, how they fly, everything about the science of birds. So Richard Feynman became an expert. But then one day, a bully comes up to Feynman and says, hey, Dick, what's the name of that bird over there? Well, Feynman knew everything about that bird, its feeding habits, its coloration, its wings, how it flies, how it made everything about the bird except its name. And then the bully said, what's the matter, Dick? You stupid or something? And then in that instant, in that instant of time, Feynman understood the difference between science and the appearance of science. You see, the appearance of science is giving names to everything. Now, of course, you do have to know some names, but that's not science. Science is about principles, concepts. 
It's about things that make things move and, and, and how they operate. It's the why of things, not simply giving names to things. And I think that's one of the problems of our educational system. So when you learn mechanics or you learn relativity theory, we should teach the concepts rather than getting bogged down with all the details. And you're gonna forget the day after the exam anyway. The day after the exam, you're gonna forget all the names of the birds, but how they fly, why they're colored the way they are, how they feed. These concepts will stay with you for the rest of your life. And that's why I think we teach physics incorrectly. We teach physics as a, as a sum total of all these little equations, but we have to understand that when Newton and when Einstein developed these ideas, they developed them as concepts. The math came later. Concepts is what's important. Now, you, you mentioned Richard Feynman's father there, and of course he was in, in terms of, it almost feels in terms of hot housing a child, you know, to basically go, I'm going to make sure that my son is going to be a physicist. And, and then, of course, also his daughter as well. Uh, and there is, who did you have? Is there anyone you remember in particular who asking those questions, those beautiful moments when it is, let's imagine how long the dinosaur is, let's look out of the window, let's look at the brown-throated thrush or whatever it might be. Did you have influences like that in your life? Uh, no, but uh, when I talk to children, I realize that what a lot of them lack is a role model because the wheel has been invented. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> like what subjects do you learn? Uh, how should you go to college? Uh, what should you should specialize in? All these facts and figures you can get from a role model. And I got my role model by reading books about Albert Einstein. So when my counselor, when I was in uh, high school, gave me wrong advice about how I should pursue my future, I knew what I had to do. I had already read the biography of Einstein. I knew what you had to do to get a PhD in physics. You have to then publish articles and try to get a professorship someplace. It was no mystery to me. I didn't have to reinvent the wheel again. So I tell children who come up to me sometimes, what should they do? Well, of course they should read books and talk to people, but find a role model, either a teacher or somebody in the community that can help you and guide you or get a role model through books. And that's what I did. So that's what I love with a friend of mine, Carlos Frank, who's up at uh, Durham University, uh, who works on cold dark matter. He actually he has a bust of Einstein in, in where he goes and sits to think. So he's looked at him all the time. He says sometimes Einstein's looking at him going, Carlos, this is a bad idea. that You've come up. I, I love the fact that even now, you know, 70 years on or pretty much not far off since, since his death. Still, there are busts of Einstein looking down on scientists who are going, oh, man, I better not let him down. I think that's a beautiful <laughs> thing. Well, one of my favorite Einstein quotes is he was talking to school children one day and he told these school children, he said, quote, no matter how much difficulty you have with mathematics, mine were greater. <laughs> so it means that even Einstein had a hard time with the math. How do you find that in terms of, I mean, there are, I would say Einstein more than anyone else in the 20th century where sometimes you'll talk about scientific ideas and people will say well we would have got there and Einstein seems to be the the only figure that immediately springs to mind where people will say no we really needed an Einstein to get these ideas this wasn't just it, it almost reminds me again of Feynman that idea you know there are ordinary geniuses and then Einstein was no ordinary genius. And it feels to me that, that, that uh, sorry, Feynman was no ordinary genius. So it feels that there's something about Einstein where uh, it becomes the hardest thing to imagine his process and how he got there. Well, sometimes late at night, we physicists start to shoot the ball and we ask ourselves a simple question. If Einstein had never been born, then how much longer would it have taken to discover special relativity and general relativity? And first of all, we say that, well, 1905, there were other scientists, uh, Fitzgerald and Lawrence, who were hot on the trail. Juan Carré even wrote down the equations of relativity. They were hot on the trail, but they couldn't put it all together. So Einstein, in that sense, was maybe you know, 10, 20 years ahead of his time. But then when you look at general relativity, the theory of the Big Bang, curved space, which gives us the possibility of wormholes and maybe even time travel, 
I mean, that boggles the mind. At that point, you realize, hey, this guy, this guy was 50 to 100 years ahead of his time. But now we realize that even if Einstein had never been born, sooner or later, somebody would have said, what about vibrating strings? They have resonances. They have subatomic particle-like behavior. And then if you take a look at the lowest excitation, the lowest vibration of a string, it is all of Einstein's theory. So that is kind of a shock. It's a shock when students learn string theory and they realize that even if Einstein had never been born, sooner or later, a hundred years later, relativity would have been discovered as the lowest note of a vibrating string. All of it, all of Einstein's theory contained in the lowest excitation of a vibrating string. That to me is staggering, it's amazing. And that's one of the reasons why young people say, I wanna work on this theory, because even if Einstein had never lived, it, relativity would have been discovered anyway. See, that's a, one of the things, going back to science education, really, which is uh, something that I think a lot of people grow up with. And again, as you were saying, that, that boredom of, of learning to recite an equation without necessarily having any understanding, really, of what it ultimately means. And you know, Einstein, like Jacob Bronowski, like many others, actually, kept talking about the fact that imagination is vital. You know, with reason, you can go from A to B. With imagination, you can go anywhere you want. And yet we still seem to have a problem, which is people say art is imagination and science is kind of doing the counting. Well, I think to a large degree, science is like poetry. And science, you know, appeals to the sense of the mysterious, the sense of beauty, to the human mind. And without that, we can't get anywhere. Uh, there's a famous story that Niels Bohr, one of the founders of the quantum theory, came to Columbia University here in New York, where I am, and Wolfgang Pauli, another Nobel laureate, gave a talk, a talk on the theory of everything, the God equation. So there was this great physicist, Wolfgang Pauli, talking about his version of the God equation. And then Niels Bohr was shaking his head like this. Then finally, Niels Bohr stood up and he said, Mr. Pauli, we in the back are convinced your theory is crazy. What divides us, however, is whether your theory is crazy enough. In other words, the imagination of a physicist has to be so wild, so crazy, that it has to propose ideas that have never been proposed before. All the easy stuff has been tried and thrown out the window. For 100 years, people have tried to find the God equation, the theory of everything, and it failed. So according to Bohr, the real theory has to be absolutely crazy. It has to be so uh, out of our imagination that we would say to ourselves, gee, I never thought of that before. So crazy and bizarre. That is the theory of everything. I, lo I love Niels Bohr's uh, uh, argument technique as well. You know, that thing of just, just saying, we agree on this more than you might imagine, which is a great way of kind of... Uh, uh, but actually, it's interesting. You mentioned Wolfgang Pauli because I was wondering... I, th I think he once said that... Um, when he was having in the 1930s particular problems in terms of during those, those, those great debates where the equations were, ah, this one seems fulfilling, no, it's not. And, and he said, you know, I wish I could just be a movie comedian. And, you know, that, that desire to just go, ah, oh, this is, do you, have you had those moments where, when sometimes perhaps a sense of progress is not there, where sometimes it feels like just finding that beauty that gives harmony to an idea just you can't seem to reach it. Do you have a have you had moments of desperation with theoretical physics and thought this was I wish I'd been a movie comedian? Well, yes. Uh, every day we fill up file thirteen. File thirteen is a garbage can. All the ideas that are incorrect and we throw them away. I should also point out that Wolfgang Pauli was a man of contradictions. On one hand, he was the ultimate cynic. If he didn't like a theory, he would say that your theory is not even wrong. <laughs> It, it doesn't even qualify to being wrong. That's how bad your theory is. And then he would also say, I disagree with the fact that you publish faster than you think. And therefore I think your theory is nonsense. <laughs> However, I was shocked. Here is this cynic upon cynic. Uh, when he talked to Einstein, uh, he did not believe in a unified field theory for the most part. He said, what God has torn asunder, let no human put back together. 
In other words, God ripped apart the theory of everything at the instant of the Big Bang. And who are we to reassemble everything to create the God equation? Well, when Pauli had cancer and he was dying, he became super religious. He delved into Jewish mysticism and he began to correspond, I think with Jung, about the theory of dreams. And he would catalog all his dreams and all the mystical experiences that he had. So here was the cynic upon cynic, the ultimate materialist, the ultimate put down artist becoming super religious when he was facing death. So that's very humbling, realizing that we physicists are, after all, mortal. See, now that that interests me as well, thinking of something I asked someone a, a, a while back, but, which is Dirac. I was fascinated with the fact that he was you know, convinced atheist who did not have a problem with the fact that, I mean, I'm sure he had some level of problem. None of us wanted to particularly die, but he, he, he had accepted the fact that his existence was finite and yet apparently was deeply disturbed by the idea that there might be an end to the universe. So he had dealt entirely with the end of his consciousness. But the idea that all of this work, all of these shoulders of giants that were stood on, that that would one day be nothing, that was the bit that struck him. Well, you know, uh, Bertrand Russell, the great uh, British mathematician, wrote down perhaps one of the most pessimistic paragraphs in the English language. It is an incredibly depressing paragraph. He starts off by saying, think of all the accomplishments of humanity. We're reaching for the stars, right? But then it's all for nothing, all for nothing. Because when the sun dies, the earth will die with the sun and all the tears that we shed are for absolutely nothing. Well, that paragraph was written in the 1930s before the coming of space travel. And now we realize that, well, that's a quaint idea, but hey, we'll leave the earth. The earth will die 5 billion years from now when the sun turns into a red giant and eats up the earth. But by then, 5 billion years from now, we'll have rocket ships. And so I tend to be optimistic. But then some people say, well, the universe is going to die. And everything in the universe is going to die because the universe is expanding so rapidly. It's going to get cold. We'll freeze to death. Stars will blink out. Everything will be black holes. It's going to be totally dark. We'll all die. At that point, when we face the end of everything, I believe that we should leave the universe. String theory gives us the possibility of gateways gateways through the 11th dimension. Of course, we do not have the technology to open up one of these gateways. This is purely theoretical, but a wormhole, a, a porthole, a looking glass, just like Alice's looking glass. A looking glass may be created because the laws of physics as we know them break down at the Planck energy. The Planck energy is the energy that Stephen Hawking would talk about, is the, is the energy of the space-time foam. It's the energy of gateways doorways to other universes. So I think that instead of facing pessimism and the ultimate death of the universe, we simply leave the universe. See, I, I always enjoy talking to astronomers who say the bit that annoys them most about the universe is how boring it's going to be for so long. There's just going to be nothing going on. You know, every now and again, a blue whale or a Boltzmann brain might come into existence. But overall, and I love that fact of just going, ah, oh, that's the bit that annoys us. It's just not much exciting stuff. Yeah, well, that's why I think we should leave our universe, join another universe that's much younger, and mess up that universe as well. So we'll have two universes to mess up. See, that seems to be the great battle where, when we do talk about the idea of, you know, moving to Mars, and that, which is, if we move with the psychology that we have, if we move with this strange, you know, sometimes this, the, the mixture of the vanities we have, the ego that we have, that, we, we sometimes talk about the, this geographical or this cosmological movement, but the, the real big change is surely needed to be in, in our psychology and what we consider to be the important issues of what it is to be on Earth. Yeah, but you're building up to a point. And, and when is your point? You're well, the, I, I, I I love reading about you know oh we can move to Mars and you know we, we, we'll we'll uh, you know terraform that or but the thing is that if we move to Mars with the same brains that we have at the moment with the same psychology that we have the same way that we treat other people then all we're going to do is go ah we trashed Mars where are we going to go now don't worry we've worked a way to get to the other universe so that that's the bit that interests me which is 
how do, and there are you know as we know there are great pieces of scientific literature which really do you know the pale blue dot is so often repeated and is a wonderful reminder of sometimes the folly of our politics and the folly of our borders and every astronaut as they you know on the iss and they look back on the earth and of course again they see no borders and it gives them a sense of humanity not the parochialism not the patriotism which so often divides us so that that to me seems to be within science that's part of the quest as well is that we as human beings and and does science are we able to through science confront ourselves with these these problems and say this is how we must change well you have to realize that as people say the earth is a spaceship and on a spaceship you have to conserve every single piece of paper every single cup every single uh, utensil because everything on the spaceship is precious and you have to be careful where your waste products are put where your energy comes from how much you consume everything has to be detailed to the to the gram well if the earth is a spaceship we have to treat it like a spaceship we have to realize that we can't pollute it we can't uh, poison the oceans uh, we can't poison the air because sooner or later, like in a spaceship, it comes back and haunts you. So once we travel to the stars, I think we'll realize how precious life is on the Earth. It's hostile out there. Mars is no picnic. The temperatures barely reach the, the uh, freezing point, uh, mel- the, the melting point of ice on the surface of Mars. Uh, the atmosphere is only 1% the atmospheric pressure of the Earth, and it's mainly carbon dioxide, you really begin to appreciate Mother Earth when you look at what's out there in outer space. It's cold, it's lonely, it's inhospitable in outer space. Now, ultimately, of course, we have to go there. Why? Because the dinosaurs did not have a space program. Now, because the dinosaurs didn't have a space program, they're not here today to argue for their position. We do have a space program. So I think ultimately our destiny is to be with the stars. But I think this could be an existential shock, realizing that life among the stars is not easy. It's inhospitable. We evolved on the planet Earth to adjust to the air, the temperature, and everything on the Earth. In outer space, it's cold. In outer space, it's lonely. And we're going to have to readjust unless we go the way of the dinosaurs. And do you have, I mean, there's, Rusty Schweikart, the, the Apollo astronaut, often talks about that sense that we have outgrown. We, 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 we were a baby and now we must, now we've grown up and now we need to leave our planet and we need to, to explore, as you were saying. And I, I wonder how, how do you think it would change us as a creature to become aware of other curious life? In, in the universe because I've, I've spoken to some people who feel that if we discover microbial life it actually won't for most people for most of the population it'll be a headline in the newspaper for a day and they won't think much more of it but curious life with the possibility of communication that is surely going to be a major psychological uh, moment for human beings well one uh, philosophical uh, note that I constantly think about is the fact that, well, physics is the universal language of the universe, and same with mathematics. On the other side of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, 100,000 light years from where I'm sitting right now, there probably is a gentleman of some sort writing down the same equations that I write down in a different notation, working on the same (laughs) 11-dimensional equations that I work on, hopefully working on string theory. We don't know for sure. But uh, it's universal. But when you think about Shakespeare, I have nothing against the great works of of literature, but it's bound to the earth. It is bound to a culture and a time frame. While in outer space, mathematics and physics are universal. They will discover the same laws of mathematics, the same laws of physics as we hear on the planet earth. And then the next question is, are they peaceful? Well, we have to realize that when Cortez met Montezuma uh, hundreds of years ago, it did not go well for Montezuma. Cortez had steel, he had the horse, he had the written language, and he had gunpowder. And the Aztecs were a Bronze Age civilization. Bronze was no match for steel. They didn't have horses. They had no written language. 
And so the Aztec Empire simply crumbled within a matter of months. So I would hope, I would hope that when we do meet aliens in outer space, we, we listen to them, we study them before we greet them as gods. Yeah, we want them to be the version that we see in the day the Earth stood still, not the version of um, it came from outer space, you know, in all those different 1950s, those great different versions. W will the will the extraterrestrials come to save us from ourselves or will they just go, <laughs> here are snacks? Or my uh, favourite, sorry. By the way, I have some advice. I get emails from people that claim that, of course, the aliens are there, they're here, I've been abducted, I've been kidnapped, I've been in a flying saucer. I have some advice for them. If you've ever been kidnapped by a flying saucer, the next time, for God's sake, steal something. I don't care whether it's a paperclip, a pencil, steal something, steal anything that's extraterrestrial. Otherwise, you have no bragging rights afterwards. Here you have proof, and there's no law. There's no law against stealing from an extraterrestrial civilization. Steal away. No one's going to put you in jail for stealing from an extraterrestrial. See, that's the problem. Ever since the extraterrestrials brought in the no smoking policy on all vehicles, ashtrays, they used to be the easiest thing to steal. You know, anyone who went, you'd always get the ashtray, but now that's made it, you've got to find something else that isn't attached. Um, it is, uh, I, I, was, I was going to ask you about God briefly, because the moment that, of course, God is used by uh, a, a scientist, there are many who will interpret it in many different ways. And Frank Wilczek, in his most recent book, Fundamentals, I, I think he starts by saying, I've got the quote here, um, in studying how the world works, we are studying how God works, and thereby learning what God is. In that spirit, we can interpret the search for knowledge as a form of worship and our discoveries as a revelation and i wonder how you feel about that as a as the definition of his idea of god well i have th sympathy for frank's point of view um I, I tend to look at the way einstein viewed the question of god uh, he did not believe in a personal god he did not believe that god created the universe just so that you can get a bicycle for christmas just so that you can smite the philistines and eliminate your enemies he did not believe in a personal God that was subject to the whims of mere mortals. He believed in the God of Spinoza, the God of beauty, harmony, elegance, simplicity. The universe could have been ugly. The universe could have been random. It could have been chaotic. It could have been a mess. It could have been a universe with no consciousness whatsoever. But here we are. Here we are in a gorgeous universe a universe where all the equations can be put on a sheet of paper. Of course, we want to get it down to one inch, but the theory of almost everything can be placed on one sheet of paper. It didn't have to be that way. It could have been chaotic, ugly, random. And so that's why Einstein said that he was like a child, a child opening up the door to a library. And in this library, there were books, books as far as the eye could see, and all he could do was take the first book out and read the first chapter in the first paragraph. But in front of him was the universe. And so I think it's humbling realizing that no matter how arrogant we get on the planet Earth, that we are just children, children reading the first paragraph of this gigantic library. Now, as we're on Einstein again, I was thinking, I should really ask you this when we were talking about death, but finding the consolations when we face up to the idea for those those people who, who do believe that, that uh, life is finer as, as I do I wondered where, where you find consolations there's that famous letter that he sent to the widow of his, his friend Michelle Bissot about the block universe really using that as about the, 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 the sense that these moments in time are still there you cannot visit them but those those time that time is not gone we have not merely just passed it and then it has vanished it still exists do you find there are specific ideas within science which also offer you some sense of consolation when sometimes we face those bleakest moments of our existence well um let me say that when it comes to something like immortality I think there's two ways in which we could become immortal, in which case we don't have to mourn the, the passing of times gone by. First, of course, is biological immortality, and we're closing in on the proteins, enzymes, and the molecular basis by which we can repair damage to cells, because what is aging? Aging is entropy, the buildup of mistakes, errors in your DNA. That's why we get old. That's why we die. But there's also cybernetic 
digital immortality. And that's much closer. Um, already in Silicon Valley, there's a company offering to digitize you, everything known about you, your credit card transactions, your emails, everything, your digital footprint digitized and to create a carbon copy of you. In other words, um, we're talking about an avatar, an avatar that looks like you, talks like you. Uh, and as we say, if, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, maybe it is a duck. So here we have a situation where after you die, your digital fingerprint, your soul, your digital soul does not have to die with you. In fact, it becomes immortal. So I think that in the future, when you go to the library, you will not just take a book out about Winston Churchill, you will talk to Winston Churchill. You'll talk to a reproduction of something that is mathematically consistent with everything known about Winston Churchill. I would love to speak to Einstein. I would love to sit down and have an afternoon conversation with Einstein, talking to a program that accesses all his memoirs, all his speeches, all his interviews, to give us an understanding of what he thought about thinking about the theory of everything. And so when we pass away, our biological entity may be made uh, turned to dust, but our digital soul, our digital soul will speak to our great, 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 great grandkids. And our great, 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 great grandkids will be able to talk to us and share our life's experience. And so the question is, is this really you? this digital soul that, that can be put into a computer and live forever? Well, it depends on how you define the word you. The English language does not define a biological you versus a cybernetic you because the English language is still rather young. But one day I think we will distinguish between two versions of you, a genetic biological you that will perish or a cybernetic you that will be immortal and live forever. And by the way, as an aside, to stick my neck out, this digital soul can be digitized and put on a laser beam. Uh, lasers are very good at shooting information into outer space, which means that your digital soul can be shot to the moon and you would arrive in the moon in about one second. No booster rockets, no dangers of weightlessness. One second you're on the moon. In 20 minutes, you're on Mars. In four years, you're on the nearest star. So I think that that's perhaps the way aliens in outer space roam across the galaxy. They digitize themselves, put them on laser beams and explore the galaxy at the speed of light. In 100,000 years, they can begin the colonization of the entire Milky Way galaxy. In fact, I'll stick my neck out even further. I think there could be a digital highway, a laser highway next to the planet Earth, containing the souls, the digitized souls of billions of aliens traveling across the galaxy at the speed of light. And we humans are so stupid, we're so primitive that we don't even know it exists. We're just clueless about the existence of the fact that the Milky Way galaxy could be teeming with alien intelligences traveling at the speed of light, colonizing the rest of the galaxy, while we're in the backwash of the galaxy, wondering, can we pick up radio from these alien civilizations or not? I think the aliens are way past radio. See, now, that, does that ever worry you in a in a even broader sense that the limitations of our senses and possibly the limitations of our minds means that there is a whole story of the universe that will never be anything that we can interrogate? Yes, we have to realize that we're very primitive. Uh, we are what we physicists call a type zero civilization. Uh, we rank civilizations by energy. Uh, a type one civilization would have the energy of an entire planet. It would be sort of like Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon planetary energy. A type two civilization is stellar. They mine the entire energy output of a star, like in a Dyson sphere. Uh, star Trek um, and the Federation of Planets would be a typical type two civilization. Then there's type three. A uh, type three is galactic. They can roam the galactic space lanes. And that would be like Star Wars. Star Wars would be a type three civilization. And then with a sheet of paper, you can calculate when we will attain these technologies. Right now, we are type zero. We get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. 
But in about 100 years, we will make the transition to type 1. In a few thousand years, we'll make the transition to type 2. And then perhaps in 100,000 plus years, we'll become galactic, that is type 3. And so if we ever do meet aliens from outer space, forget the fact that they're going to look like us or think like us or, or be just like what we see in the Hollywood movies. No, that's type 0. If we ever encounter an alien civilization, they're going to be perhaps type three, galactic, maybe 100,000 years more advanced than us, in which case new laws of physics begin to open up. The new laws of physics are the physics of the Planck energy. You know, some scientists thinking about life in outer space shake their heads and we have the giggle factor. They giggle, their eyes roll up, and they say that the distance between stars is so great that it would be impossible for aliens to visit the planet Earth. Well, that assumes the aliens are type zero. Open your mind to the fact that they could be type three, in which case they can access the Planck energy. The Planck energy is the energy at which space becomes unstable. Stephen Hawking used to write eloquently about the space-time foam, that the Planck energy space becomes foamy with wormholes and gateways to other star systems. And so we have to realize that a type three civilization is gonna use a physics that is way beyond anything that we type zero civilization people can even begin to imagine. Now, just the last couple of questions. One is when you, uh, because you, you play to very broad audiences. So what are the ideas that you see sometimes when you discuss them, you can see an audience, just their eyes lighting up those moments where I've certainly had that on many occasions where as someone who, who does not understand the physics, I will go and watch a physics lecture and something will suddenly and the whole universe changes. And when you look up at the night sky, the night sky looks different that night because you found out something new about the universe. What do you find are those moments of incredible connection that can occur? Well, I think people get an existential shock when they look at the night sky, because we spend our entire life looking down at the ground. I mean, think about it. Right now, we're looking at the ground. Most people spend their whole day looking at the ground. They never do the simplest thing, that is, look up. But when we look up, you realize that there's an entire universe out there, and we're just little pebbles floating in this gigantic ocean. And then you come up with two different philosophies, two different philosophies that are opposite, but are scientifically correct. The first philosophy is the Copernican philosophy, the philosophy that we are dust. We're nothing, absolutely nothing. We're insignificant compared to the splendor of the universe. The universe is so big and we're so tiny, we're just like dust. That's the Copernican principle. But then there's the anthropic principle, which is the opposite, which is also scientifically valid. And the anthropic principle says, no, we are special. In the universe, how many intelligent, self-aware civilizations are there that are conscious? Probably maybe just a handful in the Milky Way galaxy. Consciousness, the existence of beings that are self-aware is so small, it takes so many conditions just right to create a universe like that. Think of, the, think of the constants of nature. If the nuclear force were a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger, the sun would have burnt out billions of years ago and we wouldn't be having this conversation. If the nuclear force were a little bit weaker, the sun would never ignite and everything would be black and we would still never have this conversation. If gravity were a little bit weaker, then we would have had the big bang and the big freeze. We'd all be frozen to death right now and we wouldn't be having this conversation. If gravity were a little bit stronger, we would have the big crunch. All the stars would collapse into a gigantic supernova and we'd be burned to a crisp and we also wouldn't have this conversation. So what does it take to have this conversation? You have to fine tune all the constants of the universe. All of them have to be tuned just right to create an Earth-like planet that has liquid oceans, that has mammals, that have brains, that have consciousness, that can contemplate this question. That's the anthropic principle. So we have two diametrically opposed philosophies, both of which are scientifically correct about who we are and where we fit into the larger scheme of things. 
when do you experience transcendent moments? What for you would that be? And that doesn't have to be in terms of scientific investigation. Those moments where you perhaps suddenly do go, oh, I, I lost myself. I was in, I was somewhere else. Well, there's at least two places where you get this overwhelming sense of awe and this overwhelming sense that you're a part of a larger principle and a larger mission. When I was in high school, I heard buzzwords like hyperspace, the fourth dimension, antimatter, buzzwords in science fiction. And I wanted to know about these things. So I began to read up on about antimatter. In fact, when I was um, 18 years old, I did experiments with antimatter and I went to the National Science Fair with my experiments on antimatter. But what are the equations that govern antimatter? I had to learn something called the Schrodinger wave equation, which is ugly as sin. It is horrible. It blows your mind how complex the Schrodinger wave equation is, but it's the wave equation of matter. And then one day, I'll never forget, one day I opened the book and I saw the Dirac equation. This huge mass of discombobulated terms just collapsed collapse into an equation one inch long. And I said to myself, I am staring at the inscriptions of Genesis, that in the beginning, God created the Dirac equation. Simple, elegant, one inch long. In fact, if you go to Westminster Abbey, where all the kings and queens of England rest, in Westminster Abbey, you will find the Dirac equation. In fact, to my knowledge, it is the only equation in Westminster Abbey, an equation one inch long that makes possible electrons and antimatter. This is staggering. In fact, I began to cry. I still remember that moment. I began to cry after frustratingly working with the shortage wave equation. I realized that everything collapses, collapses into an equation one inch long. And I said to myself, wow. This is for me. I want to find another equation, perhaps no more than one inch long, that will make some other young person say, wow. So is that, that's, you, you quote G.H. Hardy in, in your book, where you say there is no permanent place in the world for ugly mathematics. Would you say that is part of, your, the, your quest remains finding those places of harmony, whether through the strings or in any other place where, where we look at the universe on different scales. That's right. Some people say that the guiding principle of physics is experiment. And of course, that is ultimately true. But then how? How do you use experiment to find the, the master theories? And that is beauty. Now, what is beauty? Beauty is symmetry. And we take a look at the universe. We see that it is quite random, quite chaotic. But then we see stars and we see atoms. They're symmetrical. And we realize that fundamentally symmetry is the key to designing the equations of the universe. Now, what theory has the most symmetries of all of physics? It is string theory. String theory has the largest set of symmetries. And why is that important? Because symmetry means that if you rearrange objects like quarks, you rearrange them, you spin them around, rearrange them, the equations remain the same. That is non-trivial. That's the reason why a sphere is symmetrical. You can take a sphere, rotate it, and it still remains a sphere. Well, I can take the quark model of, of protons, reshuffle the quark models, and the equations remain the same. So in other words, symmetry is the key to finding the theory of everything. And as I mentioned, the theory with the most symmetry is string theory. Brilliant. Thank you so much.